You're listening to the Bust Proof Business Podcast, taking your business to the next level by taking you out of it. With our experience and proven results, we'll help you find the success that many crave, but only we can help you achieve. It's time to get started with your host, Greg Murphy. Hey guys, it's Greg Murphy from the Bus Proof Podcast, and today we're talking with Travis Wren. He's the founder of Accelerlist, and we talked to him about that product, and we also talked to him about some of the other things he's working on, uh, such as foodrevolt.com, and uh, he's doing some stuff with merch merch by Amazon, and uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. He, he's a really he, he's a lot different than what I thought he was before we had the conversation. He's a really good guy, and uh, he's really trying to build a business from the ground up. And uh, he comes recommended to us from some people that we really trust. I've had some conversations with him, and I really think they're doing some really cool things over at Acceler List. So let's go ahead and right now listen to my talk with Travis Wren. Okay, hey guys, today I'm with Travis Wren who is the founder, correct, of Accelerlist? That's correct. Okay, so um, first off, Travis, I know you through uh, my buddy Caleb Roth. Um, he he works with your guys' company, but first off, tell us a little about a little bit about what Accelerlist is and what it does. Okay, so Accelerlist is a third-party listing app um, that's going to help sellers get all of their their inventory, their books, their CDs, whatever niche you're in, quickly into the Amazon Seller Warehouse, warehouse, so you can start selling it. And so th- this is something that would work. Uh, some people use other third-party solutions. Some people use Amazon's. Um, Amazon's whatever their awful interface to to list items for sale, um, and this is just an alternative to that. That's correct. Okay, how long have you guys been working on this? We are we're a pretty new company relative to some of the other third party apps. We've only been around uh, for about six months now. It's been a little bit longer than that in conception, but uh, you know, actually out there where where customers can sign up right around the six month marks when we are a brand making new um, application. But we are moving really, really quickly in terms of development. So um, we're pretty excited. But it's it's like uh, it's like driving a car at ninety miles an hour when when all the bolts are loose. It's it's been a pretty wild wide ride so far. <laughs> and so, um, how did you? What made you want to get into this niche? Because it's pretty. It's a pretty niche type of of company. There's not a ton of people. That, is this for media sellers exclusively, or or is it for for you know any Amazon seller? You know, I think we work the best for media you know if you're doing books if you're doing cds um you know any other products you know i would say that if you're dealing with a lot of products that have variations in them like shoes and clothing we might not be the best solution for you yet um but just a one touch simple item product that you're selling on amazon we are a fantastic listing option for you Okay, terrific. And so, what gave you the idea to 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 move in this direction? To to what, what did you, did you find like a need in the marketplace? Well, I mean, I think I started out like everybody else. I you know I was I've been doing FBA for a couple of years, and just you know I had a scan gun and some ambition, just like everybody else. And people started out in books, and that's kind of where I started out. And you know, it took me about a month to realize that in order to really make some good money in this business, you had to be able to scale. Um, and with scaling, you had to be able to do volume and have efficient processes and that kind of stuff. So um, I started using some of the other apps and the workflow wasn't uh, wasn't what I needed or wasn't what I thought I needed to, 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 to be the most efficient uh, that I could in terms of getting inventory to to Amazon. So I looked for a couple of solutions. I struggled with them, um, and I'm like, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to build my own. Uh, and so I set out to find a developer. That's how I found Jeff. Um, and you know, we talked about the idea. We talked about the the possibilities and how you know Amazon's bringing on hundred thousand new sellers every year. So there was definitely a market for for a software app like this. Um, and you know, he came on board and, and I, we, we did an equity split and now we're 50, 50 partners. And, um, you know, it's, it's, we're just, it's just been a wild ride since then. And so, uh, I want to get into your background here in a few minutes, but I, I want to, if it's okay, let's talk about the breakdown. So what is it? Th- so your developer builds the product, um, I'm assuming. And, and so then what is your role in the company? So I'm like, I'm the non-technical founder. So, you know, I had the idea and I, I sought out a developer. He understood 
the potential of, of the market. And he said, Hey, I like this, you know, I want to be part of this. And so instead of me just paying him um, a fee outright to have him develop it for me or, and maintain it, let's say I'm going, he came on board and, and, and got half of the equity for the company. And I was glad to do it because Jeff is just, he's a rock star coder and he's a, he's an all around good guy. So, um, you know, that's, that's where we, we started. And, uh, you know, now we're just trying to build solutions for, for for as many sellers as we can to make their lives a little bit easier. Uh, let me ask you, how is it that you guys are acquiring customers right now for Accelerolist? Um, yeah, to be honest with you, we're, we're still trying to figure it out. I mean, uh, we, we're definitely starting to be known in, in the book selling world um, because the program works so well for books. Um, so it's really just a lot of word of mouth, you know, in the Facebook groups. We are running some Facebook ads. We we do experiment with Google ads. Um, you know, we try to get out there on the forums as much as possible. So it's really just kind of organic right now. Um, and because, you know, I'm not sure if you've ever run a Facebook ad or, or a Google AdWord campaign, it's, there's an, uh, definitely an art in that. And so um, we, we either have to hire somebody to help us with it or we're, we're, we're toying around with it ourselves. But, um, you know, we're just we're exploring a lot of different things on how to get the word out because we're definitely not the brand winner right now, like, like an inventory lab or some of these other uh, listing apps that have been around for a while. So we're just trying to make a big enough splash as we can uh, as we get going. Here. Yeah, and uh, for sure, it's I, we've we have we've done about sixty thousand dollars in Facebook ads in the last twelve months for the dollar book swap. Uh, that I mean, because we don't have a regular retail store where people are just driving by and, uh, right. and just coming in, so we have to do Facebook ads every week, and so that's really our largest expense uh, is advertising. Um, so so yeah, so I, and I know for sure it is way more of an art than a science. We were doing. Uh, some of the ads that we've done before, uh, we've done tests where there's like a, a lady, I think I've spoken about this on the podcast before, but there's a lady that uh, that is checking people out at, at a book sale. And she she was a, a very attractive lady. She was the highest converting ad that we had. We had little kids reading books. We had um, an older an older lady that was checking people out um, at, at the bookstore. We had all these different ads all the different creative for the, for these ads and the one that did the best was the really attractive younger woman um that was checking people out and our demo is women you know ages uh, uh 25 to 45 that's the those are the people that are our customers and they're the ones that prefer that ad so which i thought was sure. a little bit strange but yeah. uh but who knows why things work? I mean, if you have a green background versus a red background, sometimes it's just really random how human beings think. But we're so imperfect that and we all have all these weird um, biases that we don't even understand why we prefer that. That's why, like, all the restaurants are red, like McDonald's, because we just like that for some reason. Yeah, yeah. Now, the click behavior will definitely tell you what's going on inside the head of a potential buyer. And you're right. It's like it is really weird what you end up with and what what works. And that's that's kind of what we're figuring out. So and then on top of that, you have all these little um, workflows and nuances and these little niches in the Amazon ecosystem. So it's it's very difficult to kind of just stay focused and, and hone in on one one segment that you think is going to be the best for your application or, or, the, or the, the typical avatar customer, you know? So it's, it's interesting for sure. I do think it is a really good strategy though, that you guys are focusing on media sellers uh, pretty much exclusively um, because there, there's all types of people that can, there's all types of these apps that for everyone in general, but I don't know that there's many that focus just on the media sellers. Right. And as specific as you can get your market, the, be the better it is. It's not limiting. It's actually, you know, like I have a, my trainer is working on a digital product and uh, she wanted to do something about fitness in general. And I said, well, why don't since you're working with me, I've, I've lost about 50 pounds. I was I'm, I'm still a big boy. Um, and, and I said, you know, you have experience with me and with other uh, bigger clients. Why don't you talk about uh, a, a fitness plan for people that are obese or people that are, con you know, considering bariatric surgery? And so you want to get as specific as you can so that you can be the biggest fish in the smallest pond that still is a viable market. Yeah, I totally agree. Sense. Totally agree. You guys are doing a fantastic job by, by focusing on, on media. 
But okay, so let's talk about your background, though, specific. So where did you come from? I, I just heard randomly out of the blue a few months ago. So I don't know much about your personal history at all. I'm originally from Chicago. Um, maybe you can pick that up my accent. I've heard I have a little bit of a Chicago accent. But um, so originally from Chicago, lived there my whole life. Um, born in Ohio, lived there for a couple years, and then moved to Michigan. And then my my father, and I think it was the late 80s or early 80s, uh, you know, there's a recession going on. There wasn't any jobs in Michigan. So we, he moved to Chicago and I ended up being raised as a Chicago kid. Um, and then about five years ago, uh, moved out to Los Angeles. And I don't know if it's just because it's t- beautiful weather here 24 7, but, you know, I've always had the entrepreneurial bug. Um, and so I started, um, you know, selling on Amazon. Um, and I'm, I'm big into tech. I'm big into software. Um, I'd prefer to be running a software company as opposed to um, doing something on the Amazon selling side. And so, but I loved both of those worlds. So I'm like, this is perfect. I'm like, I, I got to do this. And, you know, it's nothing ventured. It's nothing gained. So, you know, I just went for it. And you so but you're not a you're not a developer. You're I mean, do you you don't code or anything like that? I do not code. And typically, in any software business, there's a, a non-technical founder and then there's a technical founder, um, just like Inventory Lab or some of these other companies. There's, um, you know, there's a person that's, that kind of birthed the idea and, you know, does, you know, so I, you know, my role in the company is I take on the marketing. I, I do most of the customer service, interacting with our customers. Um, and Jeff is more behind the scenes uh, working on making sure the application is as buggy free as we can get it and, and it's working for the sellers. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that does make perfect sense. Um, so we, we have some software at Busproof that we're working on um, that uh, it's it's a toolkit that kind of does, it's kind of weird. When you scan into Accelerlist or Inventory Lab or wherever, whatever you scan, it's a, uh, it's a window that pops up bes- beside uh, whatever uh, listing application you're using that you, pulls up the used FBA offers yep. um, for media or new ones, whatever. But um, it was so hard. Uh, to do because I don't know the words that these people use. I don't even, it's like, they're not even speaking English, uh, (laughs) these technical people. And so it, it, to me, it's like when I, I'm the same thing with cars, right? So I'll go to a mechanic and they could say, you know, your flex capacitor has two unicorns. And so I, I don't even know what the words are that these guys are saying. It's it's definitely a different world. I mean, we had a chance to uh, fly Caleb into LA and and we all met in in, in LA to kind of help kind of shape what, what we're going to be doing over the next year and two years. And we, so we had a chance to actually see Jeff code and it was like that movie, the matrix. I mean, things yeah. are just moving the screen. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy, man. Um, but yeah, these guys, I, I kind of feel like, I don't know it. I'm sure, I'm sure that it's all like real, but to me, it kind of feels the same way. Like the mechanics, like I kind of think when I leave, they all just take a nap. <laughs> and then and then they then they bang on it when I come back and then it works. Yeah, I'm sure exactly. that's not true, but it might as well be. It just seems like magic to me. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's definitely a lot of uh, under the hood, uh, behind the scene things in software development. You know, the new rage right now is you hire somebody, you pay them five hundred thousand bucks, and you make a Chrome extension. That is good, uh, but running and doing what's the code, the lines of code. Um, that's required to do a full listing app like this is just mind boggling. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah. What you guys are doing is way more, um, interacting with all types more moving parts than we, than, than what we built. And even that was, was pretty, pretty intense. Um, so, so yeah, I, I don't understand it. Um, and I'm, you know, I just want to hit, you know, click a button and a label come out. That's all I need. Um, I, I don't need to understand how how the chef made made the dinner, um, but uh, but yeah. So so you you started um, so you 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 wanted to to open a software company for a long time. This is just the this is the idea that that you finally went with. Was there anything before that you tried that maybe wasn't successful? Um, I've been an online entrepreneur for a while. Um, I run um, the first thing I've always that I've been into in terms of online is I run uh, the largest food truck blog in the country at foodrevolt.com. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. Wow. Believe it or not. <laughs> yeah, I know that's so, a niche that Pat Flynn jumped into, right? I know. I, I don't know Pat personally, um, but I know he's a good guy and he's been really successful. And I, I was a Pat Flynn listener, you know. 
And so I, I, I did foodrevolt.com and then the next thing I know, he's in my niche. I'm like, Pat, I wanted to yeah. reach out. I'm like, what are you doing, man? Stay out of my niche because you always kill everything you do. <laughs> yeah, that's a bummer. <laughs> yeah. That's a bummer. So, I mean, he's, yeah, he's got a good thing going on. So, But there's plenty of plenty of space to go around, so it's not that big of a deal. But um, So I've always been an online entrepreneur, um, you know, so I've always played in that space. Um, but, you know, software, I've always been a nerd about it. And so, yeah, so this was an opportunity for me. But it really was an opportunity just to solve my own problem because I wasn't happy with some of the other listing options. So, and I knew there was a lot of potential in this Amazon ecosystem. You know, that's how you got started, I believe. And everybody started at some point on the spectrum. And so it was really to scratch my own itch. But then I'm like, well, hell, if I build this, you know, other people can use it too. And, you know, let's just, let's try this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Definitely. I, I think it's great. And I'm, I'm at the site right now, foodrevolt.com. Are you still, are you, is this something that's still active? It's still active. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. It looks really good, man. Um, Thanks. do you use, uh, heat maps for, for uh, on your sites at all to see where people are clicking um, and everything? I have in the past. Um, but I didn't get an, I mean, the data was there. Heat, heat maps are great, but I didn't know then what to do with that heat map. Um, heat maps are good, and, and what they do is they end up making you spend more money on your website. And sometimes it's needed, and sometimes it's not. You know, so you'll see a heat map, and where everybody's clicking, you're like, oh, if I just optimize this, then I could, you know, maybe this is, it would do this. But you know, the problem with that is you got to spend money to optimize it. And I'm like, well, I didn't, I didn't see the ROI at least for my website, but other websites, heat maps are just absolutely crucial. Yeah, and for you guys, uh, if if you're not aware, a heat map will just show you uh, where people are mousing over and clicking um, on your website, and uh, it can it can be really useful. You can look at it in the data, but it's really useful to see um, right in front of you. And, uh, yeah. again, I agree with you. I'm not sure how useful they are always. Um, but it's just good. And, and another thing is like, uh, what we try to do, especially as Amazon sellers, um, and even me owning a retail store now, I try to assign motives to my customers that are way beyond anything I could possibly ever know. So if it's dead at the shop, uh, at the dollar book swap, I'll say, well, oh, there's this football game on, or, um, it's supposed, it was supposed to rain today. Or and really, who who the hell knows what's going on? <laughs> right? right, nobody knows why anybody clicks on anything or anything like that. So, um, so yeah, so we we try to, and that's something that we all need to kind of work on as entrepreneurs is to realize that we're not nearly as important to our customers as they are to us. You know what I mean? We're just one one choice of many that that they're making in a day, and uh, they don't think about us nearly as much as we think about them. Oh no, absolutely. And it's it's the most humbling experience when you lose a customer and you didn't execute right. Maybe that's why you lost a customer and it's equally as humbling and, and joyful when you gained a new customer and it's it's that excitement each time you gain a new customer and that that you know, that frustration when you lose a customer, that's that's the you know, the the ride that you take when you're you're running software and it looks like you're getting a little bit deeper into it. So we'll have to chat sometime in the future about uh your experiences because I'm sure we'll it'll resonate with you know, with what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, it it's been awful. Um I, I built it we, we I built it for me and it worked and it was fine. And then people said, Hey, I want that too. And so I, in, in our community, in the, you know, book flipping community. And so I said, okay, so, you know, I spent double what I, what I paid to build it for me, for the community and as a, as a beta and it was a mess. And so then we spent double again. And so we're about to release a new version of it now. And, uh, and yeah, and we even call, so it got, it was named the FBA toolkit, which apparently there's always something, something like that already exists. Uh, and so to the guys at FBA toolkit.com, I have no idea what your product is and I apologize, but, um, (laughs) but we changed the name now. Just, I think, I don't even remember what it was. Something super generic. The only reason it was called the FBA toolkit before was that that's what my developer called it in an email one time. And we were just using it internally. And so it had to have the name, and so we just went with what he called it. Yeah. So, um, yeah. but yeah, it's weird, and it, but it's been terrible. I mean, actually, building something to work is is not that hard. It's building it to work for on all these different 
equip on all this different equipment and all the customer service issues and the billing and making it look nice. All that stuff is way harder than making you know a build actually work. Yeah, and that's that's been the the wild ride that we're on because there's just so many different workflows and nuances and you know if you just talk think about books and some people some booksellers they don't mind touching a book a couple times some don't want to touch it and and there's all these different schools of thoughts and on how you should. Uh, process books and, and you know what your workflow should be like and you know there's lots of gurus out there and so it's you know you have that I mean once you scratch your own itch and you build a product for yourself you're pretty happy but once you put it out there and, and let others critique it and they want to use it but they have all these other demands in, in wish lists then it can become very complex and then on top of that when you're building software in this niche you have a beast like Amazon that you know, you're, you're basically all your eggs are in this one basket and, you know, they, if they come out with one little tweak, you have to react to it. And it's, there's all these ripple waves that you were constantly reacting to. Um, and you know, you just kind of have to deal with it because they're such a juggernaut, but, um, it's, it's different than just putting out a software that can be like an email app or a productivity yeah. app. I mean, the, you know, it's, it's a much different, um, ride. That's for sure. So speaking of ripples and waves, um, Amazon put a new rule out that says that we have to have box level contents for our for our products, um, which is a bummer for me because basically we're going to have to actually add. Um, uh, I think it's going to we're going to need a whole new employee for this. Uh, yeah, because we have to now. What our workflow is going to look like is we we list all the books for the week and then we go through and then we box them up after the fact. So it's because the people that are good at boxing up books are not necessarily the same people that are good at listing books. And so we've, we decided that, you know, like Henry Ford, um, we would do an assembly line and uh, I don't, I don't subscribe to the whole touch a book one time thing. Um, I don't, I don't think that's particularly a good idea. Um, so, so yeah, but anyway, so for us, uh, Instead of the guy just throwing them all in a box and calling it a day and pal- you know palletizing them, now he has to scan each book um, again and either put the 2D barcode on. Or right now we're testing out NeetoScan's app because we use NeetoScan for our inventory management software for now, and we're t- we're using them now. I know ScanPower, Chris and them, they have boxed. Do you guys have a solution for that? Um, that's what our call was about yesterday, actually, okay. with, with Jeff and I. So we're trying to figure all that out. Um, you know, on the higher volume side, this is definitely a concern for uh, if you're the seller. Um, so for you guys, yeah, you guys have to have a solution for this. Um, a lot of the casual, I would call the, the this, you know, this customer, the casual Amazon seller, they're going to be okay with just keeping the contents to one box. And I believe, yeah, I believe you're okay in that, in that situation. And a lot of folks, I don't, I don't think it's a, it's a proven rule yet, but I, you know, there's rumors out there that if you keep your, your box to 50 items or less, then it doesn't split in the warehouse. So as long as you're not dealing with split shipments and having to do multiple boxes, I think this is not as big of a, a deal as it's getting attention about. But for a large volume sellers, yeah, we're definitely working on a solution for that. So let me ask you that then because that's interesting. So what percentage of your clients then would fit into that uh, category of, hey, we just want – we can. this isn't an issue. We can just put you know one box at a time, create a shipment and be done with it. Yeah, I mean that's the other, you know, exciting thing about running a software company is you build it for one type of avatar, one ideal person or customer, let's say, and people end up using your software um, for in ways you'd never imagine it. Um, and so it's interesting. We we built Excel list for the FBA seller in mind. And in terms of volume, our two biggest uh, volume customers. Um, ones here in the West Coast, ones in Michigan, they're they're MF sellers, um, and they have like thousands and thousands and thousands of books in a warehouse, and they're just MFing all of them, um, so they don't have to worry about box content. So that's interesting. Um, and then a lot of our customers are the casual Amazon seller, um, and so I don't think our percentage. I, I don't know exactly, but I don't think our percentage is. We don't have a lot of Greg Murphys. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, well, yeah. So there, I don't think there's a lot. We're in a weird category. I don't think there's a ton of sellers that are. There's a lot of sellers that are bigger than us, 
but there's not a ton of sellers that are, are like mid-size where we're, there's not enough revenue to develop everything custom. Um, but there is enough revenue where you need to start, you know, figuring out this stuff and, and trying to get, trying to move towards more customization. How, how could someone use your software for merchant fulfilled stuff? We're about to get really book nerdy here. How, how would that even work? Well, you know, this is, we have a, when you're done with, when you've created a batch and you're ready to upload it, let's say, um, there's an upload button and you can upload it to your MF inventory. Or you can upload it to your FBA inventory. So we are just you know, a lot of, like a lot of apps. We are just a proxy to get your products into the Amazon warehouse, um, quickly and fast, you know, quickly because their, their interfaces, they haven't put a lot of resources or time into the UI and it's not that user friendly. That's why all these third party apps exist in this Amazon ecosystem. So yeah, you just list it with us and batch it and and then they keep the books right there. And so they must have something in their SKU system that tells them where the book is on the shelf. Well yeah, that, that's funny you say that because that was the very the very first this guy in Michigan who's um he's actually a veteran and he sells um, all kinds of books to veterans, and he's just he's got a, like a warehouse, and he buys you know trailers and gaylords of them, and closeout sales. And that was we had lengthy conversations when he first came on board about how he can you know customize his SKU within Acceler List and how, how does it work and that kind of stuff. So yeah, the SKUs are super important to those guys because that's where they go and find the book when they need to pull it for sure. And so then also, so you guys don't print out any tickets or anything to put inside the book or or stickers, labels to put on the book for them to find it. They just, they, it's just by skew. Yeah. It's just by skew, man. That, I don't know. How, to be honest, I don't know how he's managing from on that, from that perspective. Um, but he's pushing a lot of books through Excel every month. It's amazing. I think it is. It, that is interesting. How, how different, uh, people will use, will, will use products that you make. Well, it's so interesting that, I mean, I even, it kind of shook me up a little bit cause I'm like, wow. I mean, our two biggest customers are our MS sellers. I'm like, should we pivot? I mean, should we, cause there's, there's a lot of MS sellers out there and not everybody's on FBA. And I started out in FBA. And so my perspective is it's, it's crazy because I'm like, I'm like, Oh, I can never do MF. I mean, that seems like so much work. And then, you know, the MS sellers will say, wow, I, I would never trust Amazon with my stuff or, right. you know, what about this or what about that? So it's, it's crazy the different perspectives out there on how large the Amazon ecosystem is and how people are, are interacting in it. You know what? What I would suggest is if if you if you were pursuing merch fulfilled sellers, I would suggest that you did have something that, uh, uh, like you could print out uh, a paper label that you could put inside the book or, or a sticker that you could put on the spine of the book, or something like that. Um, that that would get me interested in talking to you further about about merch fulfilled because you know we do a lot. I think we have over a hundred thousand books that we merch fulfill uh, that okay. we have in stock right now. So maybe that's yeah, something you're, you're, getting, you're new to FBA too, right? Or last well, year or so. Not new. I mean, we've always done FBA, but it's mostly been for textbooks previously okay. and, and books that we couldn't make any money on selling here. But recently we've moved heavier into FBA, but we're, we've, we're having some trouble right now. Um, frankly, in terms of revenue, because what's happening is that we have over, over 55,000 units in Amazon's um, stream that have not yet been delivered to the warehouse. So the warehouse we send books to, they're backed up. They're like two or three weeks behind. And so it keeps getting more and more behind. And so right now there's 55,000 units. And, you know, our average price is not high, but we, we clear after fees six or seven dollars a book. And so with all these books not being sold because they're tied up and on, sitting on a dock somewhere is having an impact. Um, on us cash flow wise recently well if you watch the amazon video about box contents they're claiming that it's going to cut that down that wait time in the inventory in their warehouse by a week i don't i don't believe it but um so that's that's what they're spending for for us to do to do box content manifest and all that stuff but we'll see <laughs> yeah we're we're gonna do our first shipments our first box content shipments um Today, actually, we're we're start, going to start using uh, box contents today, so we can get ready. Because today, uh, as we're recording, is October tenth, and um, and yeah, so we need to be ready by November. Yeah, um, and then you know the next they'll they'll do something they'll do something else in six months that'll throw us for a loop. I imagine. <laughs> yeah, they definitely will. Um, it, you know, people complain about Amazon, but I'm 
like you know long term storage and all that stuff. But I think it's great that they they give so much uh, notice. They never really spring stuff on you most of the time. Um, I know there was that to do about how, oh hey, if you if you send a book back to yourself for free, then you can't or an item back to yourself, then you can't list it again for several months. Which that just seemed like closing a loophole. It didn't seem like a big deal to me. Right. But normally they give you plenty of time to adjust your business to, to like the new changes that they're going to make. So. Yeah. And as painful as it can be sometimes, if they don't optimize, then you know we're we're counting on them for sales and and to, for to keep that ecosystem going. So if they don't optimize to keep themselves alive and, and do what's right for the customer, which is the right thing to do then they're not going to be around very long. And then either well, all these other third party apps are, are the selling, you know, that we're doing. So it's, it's good. It's, it's painful at times, but it's good. It has to happen, you know? Definitely. It definitely does. Um, I want to talk if we can, I want to go back to a little bit more about food revolt. We don't have to talk about the website itself, but just in general, um, you're the way, uh, you, you've grown as an entrepreneur. So uh, you started this. What, when did you start this uh, this blog or this this business? It's been around for four years now, I think. Okay, and is is and that it, your first uh, sort of entrepreneurial venture? It is. Um, it, it is. That's a funny story. I, I I did actually a Kickstarter campaign, and I was trying to at first. My idea was to create um, a Yelp like website for food trucks because if you go on Yelp right now. And you look at some of the food truck, any food truck review, um, Yelp has not adapted their website to to account for this little niche, this restaurant, a foodie kind of niche. And so they, they still have categories like ambiance. Well, there's no ambiance in a food truck. Where, <laughs> right. You know, it's where they're at. <laughs> and so I'm like, you know, they're just they, – they're really – and I was a little upset because I'm such a food truck fan. And they're, they weren't really recognizing this category and it's a huge it's – a, it's a category that's growing like 10x every year. Yeah, so, how, so how would you even review that? Like, you know, the mustard stand at this hot dog place was really nice. It had extra flowers. And I mean, what, yeah, how would you even do that? That's weird. Well, there's other things. Um, I wrote, I wrote a whole article on it for the, the blog, but there's, there's other things like, you know, you know, wait time. How long was the, the, mm -hmm. the wait line? Um, you know, how friendly was the service? I mean, they can focus on other attributes of the, 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 the business as opposed to ambiance and, and it's, you know, like another category, is this place good for kids? You'll see that on Yelp. That's a category. Well, you know, that's not really relative to the food truck. You could say, does this food truck have a food uh, kids menu? Let's say, you know, that'd be a more appropriate question. So, you know, I, I said, Hey, we could build a, a Yelp like website. And so I did a Kickstarter campaign. Um, and I didn't re I got pretty close to the funding level, didn't get it funded. And so I said, you know what, I'm just going to write a blog about food trucks because I like them. Um, and it's now, now it's, uh, it's, you know, it's one of the biggest blogs out there. We got, you know, thousands and thousands of hits every day. And, and so it's, it's a good thing. Yeah, that's pretty cool, man. Um, I, I love, I love food trucks too. Um, I think they're, I think it's really great. And, uh, and we, yeah, I always try to go. The problem is I don't, I live in like a sort of a almost city. Like Dayton is almost a city that's big enough for that kind of thing. Um, but not quite. I know there's some food trucks here and there, but I think that kind of thing is, is pretty amazing. And it, and it is weird to me that, that, uh, that Yelp does, you know, wouldn't respond in, in that way. Yeah. I've tweeted them. I've tagged them when I wrote the post and never got any feedback. So, you know, it's interesting. They'll hopefully recognize it one day. So have you ever wanted to have a food truck? I did, but it's, um, you know, with all the interviews, because I used to do a podcast about it, I was interviewing, you know, food truck owners all the time. And after talking with them, I'm like, well, that's a lot of work. I'm like, you know, <laughs> I think I'll just stay on the sideline and report about the news <laughs> and, and, and actually getting my hands dirty in the business. I just, I'm, I'm a foodie and I like food trucks, but I'm not passionate enough to, to cook it myself or, or everything that comes to run in the business. You know, it's, I got to give hats off to those entrepreneurs because, um, that, that is, it's a lot of hard work to run a food truck. One of the thing I wanted to do for a, a long time, uh, is have one of those, uh, snow cone, like not snow cone, but like shave ice. Yeah. Little, uh, truck things. Uh, I've wanted one of those for a while because, uh, yeah, I think those can be very profitable. I mean, it's basically Absolutely. just ice and just water, frozen water and syrup. Um, <laughs> 
And and yeah, yeah. I, I want to do something like that for a while. I'm, it's one of those ideas you have that you know that isn't unique enough to actually do anything about. But uh, you just and and it wouldn't be enough revenue to make a big dent unless we had a bunch of them. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. So then, so Food Revolt was my first for way for foray into it. Um, I'm about ninety nine percent accelerless and one percent. Um, I have a design membership club that curates designs for everybody that's in Amazon merch. So Amazon merch is like the next hot thing right now. Um, and so we have a website where we have t-shirts that are already pre-made, pre-researched, niched out and people can go in and buy these designs for really cheap and then they own the design and then they can put it on Amazon merch. They can put it on all these other websites like T Dazzle and T Spring and T Public and all this other stuff. So um, I'm definitely in the software website area. That's for sure. Yeah, I I I noticed that I get a lot of because I'm I'm in some of the Facebook groups, the merch by um merch by Amazon and all those, and I see in there I I didn't realize what what was going on with that. So can yeah. you explain a little bit more about the uh, design? You said a firm or 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 what? So it's just like when you're doing FBA or or you know, selling on Amazon, the the folks that are going to make the most money are the ones that are going to figure out how to scale. And the process as it is right now, if you don't, if you're not creative or you don't know anything about t-shirt designs, and the reason why the model is so great is because you get Amazon's traffic um, to your t-shirt design, um, and you've literally haven't spent really a whole lot of money. You just have a, a a design out there, and then people just start buying it, and then Amazon gives you their, you know, your cut. Um, but the problem is. Uh, you have to go out there and find a designer and then you have to negotiate price with that designer and then you have to um, review their work and then there's that there's a whole relationship part and do you guys get along can you work together are they giving you consistent good designs each time you order for them and so we take all of that out and we have like four designers on our team and all they do every week is create these you know, killer designs. And then we put them behind the paywall in the membership. And so you pay 15 bucks a month to have the opportunity to go in there and look and shop of all these pre-made, pre-researched um, designs. And so then you can, then you, you have access, I don't understand. So you have, you can buy these designs and then use them yourself right. or. Exactly. So they're, each design is $10 and we oh, mock up, the, and we, we mock it up on a t-shirt. So you're going to, you see what, what the end result would be if somebody bought that des- that T-shirt off of you if you were selling it, and if you like the design, you like the niche, you think there's opportunity there, then you buy it. And once you buy it, it's yours. You can put it on any website um, you want and you know, hawk that T-shirt design or that T-shirt, what you know, anywhere. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a model that we, I've researched, and it's the best to make it hands off, and it's the best to scale it up quickly because you can go on on the website and buy. 10 shirts, you know, and just had, they're done. They're ready made for you. They're already researched, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're good niches. So for those same 10 designs, you would have had to do a lot of legwork to get all those things done through freelancers and independent contract, you know, whatever. Okay. So it's really interesting what you're talking about. Uh, I just interviewed uh, this guy, Jason Miles. Uh, He has a nonprofit called So Powerful, but before he did that, um, him and his wife still today, they have this site where you basically can buy patterns for clothes that you can create, you can sew and make for like dolls and things like that. Oh, wow. So it's that it's that same kind of thing where instead of trying to make all the t-shirt designs in the world, um, you guys are kind of doing that same type of thing where you're trying, you're creating stuff and then letting other people uh, move forward with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, it's a model that works if you realize that you need the scale in order to do it. I mean, there's um, there's a really great designer out there. His name is Michael Essex, and some people are starting to notice him out on the, the Facebook groups. But you know, that guy's pulling down like I think seven to ten thousand dollars a month just on t-shirts. You know, and he's been designing them himself. But there's definitely money to be made in that world, and you know, so that's why I think he's getting a lot of attention. So we, you know, I've created something that just kind of caters to that little niche. Yeah, it, it's pretty neat, and I. It's one of those things where I I could get distracted, and and try to mess around with Amazon merch, but I I need to stay focused. I, it, yeah. it, it's just so great where anybody, all you basically need is an idea, and this is just the best time in the in the in the history of the world to have an idea and to execute because now literally all you have to do is go pay some guy on Fiverr to create the idea that you have and uh, put it on a T-shirt. And if it's a good idea, the market will 
And uh, I mean, there has there in the whole history of the planet, there's never been a time as good as now having an idea, taking it to market with all this create print on demand stuff. It's just been it's been great for, you know, flourishing of ideas. Yeah, well, it's amazing. The the productivity apps that Jeff and I use to communicate with each other, these were not around six, seven, ten years ago, you know, like Slack and, and all these other ones. And so it, in order, you know, to bring an idea from its beginning to inception is it's a lot easier now. And that's that's the wonderful world we live in right now with all the technology. It's amazing. Yeah, we, we love Slack, too. Um, I'm getting into now Voxer or Vox, whatever it's called. Uh, my, okay. my wife used it. Uh, she has a friend that she keeps in, con- in touch with using Voxer. And it's sort of like um, somebody can record you a message and send it to you. And you can just respond um, by voice instead of having to text. And uh, okay, you, can yeah. do that. you can do that natively on Facebook, but but you can create groups and things like that. And it's I, I've one of the things that I failed my audience a lot in is responding to emails. Um, I'm really bad at actually sitting down in front of a computer and, and responding to all the emails that I get every day. And I hate so, <laughs> oh, it's awful. Um, because and I feel like I'm failing all the time, but I can't just sit there and do that all the time. But as, right. but especially for a paid group for uh, Bus Proof Labs, um, I really want to make sure that I that I'm available to them. So what I did is I put my Voxer information in Busproof Labs and people now can just send me a, a, a message and I can just respond with my voice uh, wherever I'm at. I don't have to be in front of a computer. I can just do a really quick, just a really quick response. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a double-edged sword because it's an always on heads down kind of society right now. And um, if you give them that door to access you more easily, then they expect a response. So at least with email, you can be like, oh, I didn't get into my email today. I mean, it's all, we're always on, especially at Accelerator List here. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword. It takes, it takes up a lot of your time for sure. That, that's true. And, but that, that isn't, that's something that's very important. I, I don't do anything with work um, after four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, I, I just don't do it. I have my daughter um, and my wife and I just won't from now from, from like 4 PM till 10 PM. I'm just not doing anything. If for some reason I'm up late and I want to, that's one thing, but, uh, some, uh, we've, we've fired a few customers before where they'll, they'll say, well, I emailed you on Thursday and, uh, and I didn't get, or, and they'll, they'll email me on Monday morning, super angry um, right. that it's been five days. And I'm saying, well, you know what? Here's all your money back. Right. Um, we're just not the company for you. Because yeah. I'm I just you know, we I do the best I can, but I I don't I'm sure you're spending your weekends with your family and so am I. We're yeah. not we're not a large enough company where, you know, we have teams of people doing this, that and the other. So you I mean yeah. for for my I mean for me this is more of a, a lifestyle business for me. Like I we make I make enough money that we don't have to worry about um I don't have to be working 80 hours a week and I just won't do that. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's super important. We've already we've already had to do that at, at Accelerlist too, and it's and you know you gotta you have to work balance work and life, otherwise you're not going to be in it for the long haul, and that's that's what you want to be around. Yeah, for for sure, for sure. Well, uh, Travis, I've taken up enough of your time uh, today. Tell us where we can find you, where we can find Accelerlist, and how do you spell it? By the way, it's not. Um, let, let's make sure we spell it for for the audience as well. Yeah, it's one of those weird hybrid words that we put together. It's you know, it's a combination of acceler- accelerate and list. So it's it's a c c e l e r l i s t dot com, accelerlist dot com. And we'll definitely make sure that that's in the in the show notes uh, for sure. You guys can check that out, accelerlist dot com. Thank you so much, Travis. Um, and I will talk to you soon, buddy. All right, man. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure being on the show. <laughs> All right, thanks. So hopefully you guys enjoyed uh, that discussion that we had with Travis. Now, he represents something that I think is important. Uh, you know, he, he's not a guy that gives up. He's not a guy that uh, that doesn't follow through, that doesn't keep working hard. And, you know, one, one of the things I thought that was really interesting about the talk was we really are living in a time that has never existed before. We've never had um, a time where we could you know, just buy stuff and have it show up that same day with, you know, Amazon now and the way that, you know, with merch, 
on Amazon that you can come up with an idea and post it for a t-shirt and have something be able, someone be able to buy it without you having to create anything ahead of time. It's absolutely amazing the world that we live in today, and it's something that we should definitely not take for granted. Now, you can again find Travis at Accelerolist.com, and if you're into food trucks, you might want to check out foodrevolt.com too. I thought that was pretty cool. So, and again, as always, you can check us out at busproofworkshop.com to get additional training and more information about exactly what we're up to. So until next time, guys, make today count. That's all for this episode of the Bust Proof Business Podcast. Be sure to point your browser to busproofworkshop.com to sign up for our mailing list and to get your opportunity to enroll in one of our specialized seminars, guaranteeing you continued results in typical bust proof fashion. Thanks again for joining us. We look forward to taking your business to the next level right here on the Bust Proof Business Podcast.